today you're going to see a black background, which means that it's thinking about thinking or um, the other terminology that I would use is this as uh, the scholarship of teaching and learning or SODAL. You'll hear that term as well. And my students who are studying food science with me at Niagara College know that oftentimes I talk about the learning process and why we are teaching and learning the way that we do. And some of our project partners are also really interested in learning about how it is that we are doing our teaching and learning practices. So this is about learning taxonomies. And I often I get really quite excited about these things because I like to think about what are the procedures and the the I want to say the linearity of the learning process. And so taxonomy is just a way of us organizing the learning process so that we know that we're on the right track in terms of progression. So at the end of this video, you'll be able to appreciate the complexity of teaching and learning in food studies using a dimensional lens. You'll describe the, the dimensions of teaching and learning for food systems education using a number of learning taxonomies models, and that would include Vygotsky's zone of proximal development, Bloom's taxonomy, the ICLE rigor relevance model, Elmore's modes of learning, and Pavlova's taxonomy for sustainable education. And we'll apply taxonomy in context of curriculum design and indexing. And of course, we're always going to talk about food systems because that's what I do. <laughs> and we have a ton of fun with it, thinking about all these things. So really, when we're thinking about taxonomy, we're organizing learning into meaningful um, pathways and progressions so that the learner is able to effectively assimilate anything that we're delivering within that classroom space. And it really begs the question, who is that learner? Who is it? Is it a child? Is it an adult learner? Is it a person who's in the workforce needing learning for professional development? Is it a teacher who is in progress of professional development? Each of these learners has a different space and a different time and a different starting and stopping and goal with the learning process. And so we have to be really deliberate to think about this as a key question. So we have to reflect who is the person that needs to learn about food systems and innovation and why do they need to learn it? What are they going to use that learning for? And what is their starting skill and knowledge base? Because how we design teaching and learning tools really needs to reflect on this. You can't just go in and start, I, I, I teach uh, food chemistry, for example, I can't go in and teach to a child the same way that I would teach to a graduate student or to an industry professional. I have to think very deliberately about each process. That said, could I teach food chemistry to a child? Absolutely. If I am thinking deliberately about who that learner is, what their starting skill and knowledge base is, and what they're going to use that learning for. A professional is going to use the learning very differently than a child would. And so that's a really foundational question that we need to do for any sort of curriculum design and learning taxonomy. Now, in traditional education, we've always thought of learning as sort of this linear process that we start at a, a certain point and we are given bite-sized pieces of information and we go on that linear progression. But the reality of education is such that um, people are all over the place and stuff happens and some days people have good learning days and sometimes the, the content is great and other times the content is not so good. And so most people's learning journey is not linear. It is cyclical and it is um, iterative and it is quite um, irregular in its, in its tendency. But we have to remind ourselves of setting that singular purpose that we want people to be able to learn and to be able to grow and to be able to participate in economies and livelihoods and um, learn just for the sake of learning as well. So again, we keep reflecting on the journey of learning about food systems as well, and that food systems are not singular. They are very, very complex. And there's so much diversity, whether that is cultural diversity, whether that is geographic diversity, whether it's diversity of people in different socioeconomic statuses. Everyone has a food journey because everyone eats, but everyone has a different food journey and how they're going to apply it. And so we're going to jump into some slides here. When we, uh, these were slides that we prepared for um, the Food Systems Game Changers Lab, and that was sponsored by the Thought for Food organization and the Rockefeller Foundation. And so 
thinking about the continuum of food literacy, people are going to be learning about food throughout their life, whether that is through early childhood, through adolescence, through adulthood. And each of these points of the life cycle has an important role in terms of the literacy skills that you absorb. Um, we're also learning for different points in our personal development. So they could be learnings for self. So I can learn how to feed myself. I can learn how to feed my family. I can learn how to obtain food, grow food, um, and celebrate food for myself. But it, it can also extend out to community. It can extend out to vocation. And this is where we're starting to look at food as a means of employment. This is where I, I tend to focus most of my attention in terms of skill development for employment and skill development for leadership. But um, that continuum is, it's, it is, it is indeed a continuum where having an understanding about food skills for self and food skills for family, and perhaps even food skills within childhood helps us on that continuum towards food skills for employment and leadership as well. Now, of course, food systems are also, as I mentioned before, very complex. And so we could be learning about food systems um, across the entire value chain from environment, agriculture, through selection and preparation, consumption, even celebration. Um, learning about food systems from a values perspective is important, too, to think about its role in culture. And of course, life cycle. This is a key piece of the puzzle now, understanding the impact of food on environment and how this entire value chain cycles back on itself um, with food waste, with environmental uh, impacts, with climate change and so on. And what's really neat to think about, and I, I get really excited about all of this, is that every one of these dimensions has an aspect of all of the classical different um, academic domains. And so, for example, I could be thinking about food preparation from a science perspective. That's that's kind of what my, my main job is, to teach food science and food manufacturing. But we can also think about preparation from an ethical perspective. Do we in, in ensure that there's access to food and that people have the infrastructure to be able to prepare food? We can take it from all of these different domains and apply each of these different aspects of food literacy across academic domains. So it's not just within the realm of science, it could be within the realm of communications. Can I write instructions about how to prepare food? Can I think about the nutritional implications from a health perspective? Engineering, can I look at the equipment and technology that is necessary for the preparation of food? All of these different domains fit across every one of these different aspects of the value chain as well. Then, of course, we are starting to get into some of the learning taxonomies. I have this slide and I, I like this slide, but I'm going to re revisit it at a later point. But when we're thinking about learning, we're thinking about knowledge and, of course, having the facts and figures in our head to be able to do things. But food inevitably is a tactile learning experience. Food we eat, we have to be able to manipulate it. And so there's an aspect of application that we've got to be able to do food that we just can't think about it. We have to be able to go out there and actually apply the skills that we have. From there, within this taxonomy, then we're going into more um, complex aspects of application. Can we synthesize new ideas or come up with innovations? And of course, mastery is uh, the term that we use most commonly for the, the highest order of learning taxonomy, where we have learned this skill and we can use it in unpredictable ways. We can also teach it to other people. And so we have to go along this continuum. This is something that I see quite frequently in that um, I work a lot with teachers and, and teacher training and the teachers will have perhaps lived in the textbooks for much of their, um, much in, much of their teaching career, but they never had to go and do the application piece. And so it's very challenging for them to then turn around and do the, the teaching themselves in a way that the students then can apply it at a high order taxonomy themselves. So we are always challenging our teachers uh, when doing teacher training to get out there and just do stuff and to step outside of the ego and say, yeah, let's, let's just go and explore because there has to be a bit of playfulness and a bit of curiosity and um, willingness to make mistakes strategically so that the learning process occurs. And then of course, learning 
is not just about facts and figures. It is also about values and about practical skills. And so we can't go and do food, as I like to say, unless we have a sense of appreciation or a sense of uh, cultural understanding or a sense of um, ethics and, and principles behind how food is a human right. We also have to have physical or practical, um, the term is psychomotor skills, to be able to manipulate equipment, manipulate um, the food itself, um, to be able to taste is also a practical skill. And so understanding the flavors and um, textures of quality food is another skill that we need to be teaching deliberately. We can't read a book and know what something tastes like. We have to go out and do it in a practical way. And of course, learning can be across a wide variety of different settings. It, um, again, these slides were prepared with um, the TFF um, Food System Game Changer Lab in mind, but it could be in the school setting. It could be extracurricular out in the community. It could be through uh, community caring scenarios where perhaps parents are taught how to teach their own children. In other cases, I didn't put this into the graphic, but uh, it could be within the, the workplace setting and it could be through self-organization. So we are seeing a huge rise in digital commons and digital knowledge hubs where people can learn for, their, for themselves. And this is, this is something that we're exploring with the World Food Forum in particular, looking at what digital commons look like so that we can help facilitate some of the informal extracurricular or community caring or um, alternative learning scenarios that happen outside of the, the traditional ac educational sector. So I'm jumping back to some of the um, SOTL slides that I have from before, but often when we think about the learning taxonomy, we are often thinking about skills for life. So um, these, are th these are skills that we have to have to be able to function as good human beings working together. And these are things like literacy, numeracy, um, collaboration, adaptability. I have a different slide presentation um, talking about the skills for success, which is how we frame it in Canada using some models from our um, ministry called the Employment and uh, Employment Development uh, or Employment and Social Development Canada. Pardon me, I'm having a moment here. Employment and Social Development Canada uses the term skills for success. And these are those transferable skills that everyone needs to be able to live. Then we're moving to employability skills. So these are things like collaboration, teamwork, um, problem solving. <coughs> Pardon me. Being able to have skills that transition to any sort of employment. Then moving up the taxonomy, we're looking at skills that are specific to the vocation and then advancing even further in, in, the, in the technical difficulty towards specialist skills. And so when thinking about food systems, there are aspects of all of this that we could be learning food skills for life. Everyone has to eat. We could be learning food skills within the context of employability, but uh, more often than not, we actually hop straight to food skills as a vocation or specialization. Um, we're going to reflect a little bit more on this moving forward. I wanted to jump in here with a quote from Lev Vygotsky. He was a Soviet um, era scientist in the 1920s and uh, through the 1940s. And he was doing a lot of early research on understanding the learning process and the learning progression. And I like this quote very much. It, it says, learning is more than the acquisition of the ability to think. It is the acquisition of many specialized abilities for the thinking about a variety of things. And so I really like that fact that it's a very systems-based um, approach to thinking about learning. Lev Vygotsky is going to be one of our first models that we talk about here. Um, another quote from another scientist who works in um, teaching and learning is from uh, Dr. Benjamin Bloom. And we will talk about Bloom's taxonomy in a moment as well. But again, that same principle that any person in the world can learn, almost all persons can learn if provided with the appropriate prior and current conditions of learning. And so it is that aspect of reciprocity in the classroom that the teacher has to be really thinking about what that learner needs to learn and what is the space and the appropriate conditions to make sure that the learning can occur. And taxonomy is a, is a key way of making that happen. This is Bloom's taxonomy, and it has been revised and adapted in a wide variety of different formats over the years. But the key principle is that we need to have this baseline of remembering knowledge and, and facts 
and then moving up into the space of understanding and applying. This is, again, thinking about getting into the doing of learning. And application is what is very common in so many institutions that are adopting uh, what we call competency-based education and training. I, I am a competency-based education and training specialist, and I really like to jump as fast as possible into the application space so that my students are doing the learning. And so they're, they're learning the facts and figures while they're actually doing the task themselves. And so finding ways of um, demonstrating the vocational outcome as fast as possible. From there, we're moving up into some of these um, more complex ways of learning and complex ways of doing where we're analyzing, we're synthesizing and evaluating and creating. Now we're getting into that space of innovation where people are using the knowledge and the, the ability to apply it and using it in new and unique and unpredictable ways so that they're able to create um, new outcomes and new innovations that are meaningful for meaningful for the sector. And so we try and encourage in our teaching and learning a lot of activities that are in these higher order spaces, knowing that while we're still in the teaching and learning environment, students can make mistakes. When we have the space to practice these higher order learning skills, then the students are able to, uh, I want to say, get the nerves out and be able to be really, really comfortable in this space because this is what we need. We need innovators. We need people who are able to take that leadership role. And that is that higher order taxonomy. Even now, I often have dialogue with many of my colleagues who say, well, early students can only be in this space. And I disagree quite, quite heartily. I, um, I've often had dialogues too, where they say, well, children can't be, and I, I say, that's quite silly. For example, let's say we needed to teach about food hygiene. Um, could I teach a, a child about food hygiene? Absolutely. Could I uh, have them wash their hands and understand when is it, when are there different times when washing their hands is important? Could I help them find unique ways of washing their hands, perhaps if they didn't have, to have a sink? Absolutely. And so children are able to do higher order thinking. And I want to make sure that we're not prejudiced to think that certain learners are not able to be creative or certain learners are not able to analyze. Again, Benjamin Bloom's approach is that every learner, when given the right conditions, is capable of learning even these very high taxonomy learning uh, skills. We just have to be making sure that we are not progressing too fast and that we're not starting too high at, at the starting point to make sure that people can go along now, often when we're working in Bloom's taxonomy, we'll see all these different verbs. And when we're thinking about Bloom's taxonomy, we are very deliberately saying, what does that learner need to learn? And how are they doing it? And so the verbs make the learning into an active process. And so, for example, every one of my uh, YouTube videos starts with a uh, slide at the beginning saying, at the end of this video, you will be able to, and then I use different verbs. And that puts the learning into the active space so that we're learning deliberately and that I want you as the learner as we're going along to be able to think about the different active ways that you're participating even though watching YouTube videos doesn't seem that active you are actively learning by participating and watching. Now Bloom's taxonomy also includes these other um, thought processes. Now we've focused a lot of our conversation the past couple of minutes on the cognitive domain, the, the aspect of thinking about the learning approach, but there is also the aspect of affect that um, learners need to have value systems and emotional approaches to learning. And so learning about caring about things or valuing things or appreciating things, these are also effective uh, ways of learning. And we need to not just live in facts and figures. We also need to build up these value systems, especially in food systems where we need to think about ethical approaches. We need to think about equity. We need to think about um, the importance of the environment and not just from a facts and figures perspective, but from a caring perspective. Then of course, there's the psychomotor domain. That's where we're actually physically doing things. And while there's a picture of a hand here, in many cases, food systems are about all of the different senses and a wide variety of tactile experiences. So for example, I could learn and I could read a book about wine tasting, but unless I actually go and taste wine, I will not be able to tell you about the sensory properties. And so 
tasting food products is an important part of psychomotor learning. Cooking, uh, manipulating food products, manipulating laboratory equipment. These are all psychomotor ways of learning as well. And so we have to be really cognizant that we are creating a, a wide range of learning strategies that I realize that um, many knowledge hubs are very focused on cognitive domain, but all of these are really important learning. Then let's jump back to Lev Vygotsky here. This is Lev Vygotsky's taxonomy of what he calls the zones of proximal development. And this is where we're thinking about the progression of the learning skill. We have to think about what that learner can do on their own. And that's this, that baseline um, knowledge or that baseline capability. And we can't push too far too fast. For example, I could walk into a kindergarten class with my uh, looking across my room and going, I could walk in there and start reading Fenema's food chemistry to the, the children and they would all just tune out. But if I walked in there and talked about um, atoms and molecules, and maybe we made uh, atoms and molecules with, uh, with marshmallows and toothpicks, now we can so start to think about chemistry in a way that's, that's tactile and approachable for children at the kindergarten age. We have to think about what that child can do or the learner can do because they could be adult learners as well and what they can't do and find that space in between. We need to challenge our learner to do things and, and it's and learning is not always easy, but we can't jump so far so fast that the learner uh, becomes disaffected by the learning process. And that is something that we have to really take a reflective practice to do understanding who that learner is and what what clicks with them and where that baseline knowledge is. Now this is the ICLE uh, taxonomy and what we also call the rigor relevance framework and it is an adaptation of Bloom's taxonomy. So you'll see on the on the vertical axis Bloom's knowledge taxonomy that knowledge awareness application synthesis and so on um, and then on the horizontal axis the idea behind this is that there are times where even in higher order learning, you don't need to know everything. And so we have to be really deliberate about what do we need to be able to use in very complex and unpredictable situations. But do we have to be able to use it in always a higher order perspective? I really like this framework because there are times where I say I need people to know stuff and they may be very advanced learners, but I don't need them to be pushing every um, every learning taxonomy to the highest limit. So for example, I work with food technology students, but do I need them to know how all of the electrical circuits work? No, I need them to know that they're there. I need them to know that um, equipment functions with electricity and that, but if they really need to be understanding that, that they're going to be collaborating with electrical engineers or electricians to be able to better use the equipment. I need them to focus their attention on other aspects of the learning, like how do I optimize the equipment for the processing of different food products? I have to be really deliberate about what rigor and what relevance do I need for each of the different learning outcomes. I keep mentioning the word learning outcomes. I have some different videos on how to design learning outcomes, and I encourage you to take a look at those as well. This is another learning taxonomy model that I, I do speak about quite frequently, and it is from Richard Elmore at Harvard University. And he speaks about um, the different strategies of the learning environment. And so the hierarchical individual space is that traditional didactic learning space where the teacher is in charge and the teacher is disseminating knowledge to the learner through a very linear channel. Pardon me, I have a bit of congestion. Moving from there across the, the top of this diagram, we then have the distributed individual where there is somewhere a teacher who has that knowledge and they are channeling it to the learner, but it could be very distributed. So for example, online courses, this YouTube channel, for example, is an example of distributed individual learning where you are pacing your learning, you are finding what is useful for you. Now, if you're in my courses, you will note that I do embed these videos into your weekly course packs. Um, but the distributed individual learner is very much focused on finding your own environment for learning. Self-organized learning is, is often like this, or the use of uh, massive online open courses or MOOCs as, as they're commonly known. 
hierarchical collective on the bottom part of the diagram, so bottom left, now we're talking about where you still have a instructor or a teacher in charge of that space, but there's a lot more collaborative aspect, a lot more teamwork and coaching involved. And so in this case, there's a lot more reciprocity between the student or the learner and the teacher or the instructor within that space so that there's there's reciprocity and collaboration to know what those learning outcomes need to be but in in the end that the teacher is still the one in charge of the space and the the key holder of the knowledge moving into the other um, distributed uh, quadrant that would be the distributed collective quadrant and that is where the teaching and learning environment blurs between who is the teacher who is the learner and Instead, the teacher becomes very much that facilitator that the learner comes in and sets what their objectives are going to be and what their goals are going to be. And the the teacher becomes the facilitator to help coach the learner to help themselves become self-directed learners. And I love this this quadrant as well. And I do a lot of distributed collective teaching uh, because I do innovation work and it's hard for me to walk in and say there's only one model of innovation. I try and create opportunities for our students to go and innovate and find their own pursuits and then do a lot of teaching and coaching and mentoring where they need to be so that they can achieve the innovation goals that they have. Last but not least, one last taxonomy. There are more taxonomies out there, but these are ones that I personally like to use. This one is um, really great and it's very focused on the uh, understanding the environment and sustainability. This one was developed by Margarita Pavlova at Hong Kong University of Education. And her taxonomy is very focused. At, you'll almost see parallels between the, the, the pyramid or triangle taxonomy that it has at the very beginning, where we were learning about, we were learning for, the, uh, for our person and learning very much for oneself and then progressing up this uh, vocational taxonomy. In this case, Pavlova's taxonomy is focused on the progression of skills for learning about environmental sustainability. And so again, a very affective domain at the base, appreciation and personal values for greening and environmental, environmental concern. That in order to be able to learn some of these higher order taxonomies, one has to have a strong emotional and values-based connection to environmentalism. Then moving into greening skills for life, so things like waste management and recycling and uh, energy conservation. These are skills that are very translational across all sorts of domains and can be used in one's personal life as well as in basic, basic industry. But then we're moving into industry specific skills. So if we're in the food industry, for example, things like waste management or um, energy conservation, using it within the general industry perspective and then working within the within the industry specific greening skills. So let's again going into into the food industry, food waste management, composting, biogas remediation. Um, what else? Demaic systems. These are all existing systems. And then what's what's really challenging and what I really like about Pavlova's taxonomy is that she pushes us into the space of thinking very future oriented that we have to not just sit back and say, yep, the tools that we're using, we're using and we're doing the best that we can, but that we have to have a sense of continuous improvement and always looking for that next opportunity. What are those future greening skills? What's challenging about her taxonomy and, and challenging in a positive way is that um, when working with teachers in particular, I've been working on a project called the Skills to Access the Green Economy. In many cases, the teachers themselves need a lot of um, upgrading and uh, reskilling to be able to understand what those current skills are. And it's a really, we have to look at it very positively, it's a really amazing exploration to go through to be able to figure out what those skills are. And it takes reflective practice with our teachers to be able to say, where are we as individual teachers in our own learning journey to know what we need to learn so that we can then respond to our learners. And it's, it's almost a, philosophical to jump into that sort of space of knowledge and ego and um, affect to be able to to say yeah you know what I I have stuff that I need to keep on learning myself and that's a pretty remarkable thing to do so 
just to wrap this up, I had some, uh, again, just to wrap up, uh, I have delivered this workshop in person, but who is that target lender? Who, who um, do we need to be in their knowledge progression? What competencies do we need to reflect on? And how do we design for all of this diversity of learning domain? There's not a single answer. And as different organizations are working together to find solutions, I think it's really important for us to take the time and reflect on all of this. So I'm going to leave you with one more quote from our good friend Lev Vygotsky, who is, I would say, like a, like a guardian angel in terms of helping us on our learning journey. The teacher must adopt the role of facilitator and not content provider. And it's really uh, almost uh, uh, futuristic to read that quote a hundred years after he wrote it, that uh, um, we need to be really thinking about teaching and learning as a really dynamic environment. And there's a lot to learn. And I'm really happy that you've uh, come along this journey with us. And I love hearing your questions. I love getting the questions on the YouTube channel. And of course, all my students. Um, I, I am always there to have more conversations about this and come up with more good ideas for what we can talk about together. Take care and we'll talk to you soon.